Just before an interview in 2016 at Trump Tower begins, the fake orange fuck pudding sits down in front of a fake painting. There it is. It's supposed to be Renoir's Two Sisters on the Terrace. But it's not. It's a lie. It's a fake. Let's see that video again. You see the fake? We know that fake billionaire Donald Trump has enough fake cash to be able to afford one fake painting by Renoir. A fake painting like that might go for as much as 78 million fake dollars. That's a lot of fake cash. But what about two fake paintings? Does a fake billionaire have enough fake money to afford two fake Renoirs? That is our mystery. I'm not going to go into too much depth about the first fake Renoir. The media has reported on it. The gentleman in the picture above wrote a biography about Trump. One day, Trump showed him the painting and said it was the original. Tim O'Brien knew he was lying because he's from Chicago and saw the painting at the Art Institute of Chicago. Even after he was called out on it, Trump continued to lie. This is a book I acquired entitled Master Paintings in the Art Institute of Chicago. This is a page from that book. And this is from the museum's website. Note the date in the last line, 1933. The Art Institute of Chicago acquired the painting before Trump was born. Before we get to the second fake Renoir, Let's look at how this kind of brazen lying and self-aggrandizement permeates the bloviator's character. There were the fake Time magazine covers that Time had to ask him to take down. He probably didn't want to frame the real ones. Then there are the cufflinks. I'd call as my next witness, Charlie Sheen. So he says, uh, these, are, uh, these are platinum diamond Harry Winston, uh, and he pulls off his cufflinks. And he gives them to me. This was an appearance on the Graham Norton show, and Mr. Sheen goes on to explain how he discovered the fraud. Six months later, I had a, uh, some jewelry getting appraised at the house, you know, and, and, and she finished and was leaving. And, and I said, oh, yeah, you know, there's, there, there, there's another uh, couple of pieces that I have that I'm, that I'm very curious about. Could, would you mind appraising these? She said, no, uh, what are they? I said, well, you know, I explained the dinner and this and that. These were from Donald Trump, Harry Winston, you know, flawless D's, platinum. She, she took the loop, uh, spent about four seconds, and, and kind of recoiled from it, uh, much like people do from Trump. And, um, <laughs> and so, so she says, uh, in, in, in their finest moment, this is cheap pewter and, and, and bad zirconias. <laughs> and they're stamped Trump. And I just thought, I just thought, what does this really say about the man? Fake paintings, fake magazine covers, fake billions, even fake cufflinks. It didn't have to be that way. Trump had the opportunity to purchase very valuable and fine art. Andy Warhol agreed to paint Trump Tower, and the artist created eight silk screens for Trump to choose from. But he reneged on the deal. A tiny paper doodle by Warhol recently sold for $32,500 at auction. If you look at the highest prices paid for art, Warhol figures prominently on that list. He's had two paintings fetch over $100 million. He's had five others that brought at least $69 million. While somehow managing to lose money owning casinos, the orange dictator weasel managed to screw up his best investment. With all this in mind, let's move on to the second fake Renoir. It is called La Loja. In English, that means the theater box. It was painted in 1874 by Pierre Auguste Renoir. The male with the binoculars was Renoir's brother Edmund. The female could be a pre-plastic surgery Melania. The painting has its own Wikipedia page. In fact, the second sentence in the Wikipedia entry reads, quote, It is part of the collection at the Court Old Institute of Art in London. But wait, here it is in Melania Trump's office in Trump Tower. Is it a real Renoir? Of course not. It's a fake. It's not real. I saw this picture in an article and knew it was a fake. I had hoped that this was my discovery, but a couple of art lovers beat me to it. 
a New York Post writer determined that it was probably a skillfully painted copy, what I would call a fake. The writer asked for a response from Trump, but did not get one. The Court Old Gallery has the temerity to advertise their original painting on their website. Note, the original is 80 by 63.5 centimeters, or about 31 and a half inches by 25 inches. That's a pretty big painting. I would say that the painting on the wall in Melania's office is about that size. But the Trump painting can't be an original because the original hangs in a museum in London. There's a plot twist. Renoir painted a second version of La Loja. And just like every other bullshit lie, fraud, or crime from the orange racist muck piddle, there was a conservative there to defend him. The defender was a senior contributor on art and culture for the Federalist. Much like Adolf Hitler and Hermann Goring collecting art, the Federalist collects opinion on art. Strange world. Appropriately enough, her name is Maureen Malarkey. I'm not kidding. She wrote that the original sold at Sotheby's for close to $10 million in 2008, and that, quote, a Renoir would have been a lovely present for the current Trumpess, end quote. Well, that's wrong and gross. Trumpess? It's wrong because the original was a gift by bequest to the courthold in 1948. Trump was two years old at the time. Now, the second Renoir was auctioned in 2008 by Sotheby's, and it did go for 7.4 million British pounds. Could that be it? Could that be what's hanging in Melania's office? No, not possible. You see, the second version of La Loja was about 10.5 by 8 inches. Here's the actual auction listing from Sotheby's website. Notice the dimensions. Now let's return to Melania Trump's office and use a little perspective. I've highlighted the laptop on the table, which is closer to the camera than the painting. Obviously, the painting in Melania's office is much larger than 11 by 8. It can't be the second Renoir. It's too big. It can't be the original because that's been in the Court Old Museum in London since Trump was two years old. It is a fake, a lie. You've seen exclusive proof that both Renoirs are lies and frauds. Why paintings? Why does Trump lie about paintings? The short answer is that he lies about everything, but I think paintings are a special case. Paintings are portable, liquid, easily converted to cash. It was on his plane that Trump first lied about two sisters on the terrace. He kept it there for some reason. Nobody sane would keep a $100 million painting on an airplane. I think that that incident speaks to Trump's lies about paintings. You see, you can lease a plane. You can purchase one by installments. Lots of bankrupt airlines own planes. Trump Airlines was one of them. On the other hand, paintings by Renoir have to be paid for with cash. Tens of millions of dollars of the stuff and the payment must be made shortly after the hammer drops. A plane can provide you with transportation. It affords you travel options and comfort. You can deduct your plane as a business expense. It is a tool. A work of art in the hands of Trump is also a tool, even if the artwork is fake. It has no other purpose besides providing status. When he showed off his fake Renoir, Trump pointed at the supposed Renoir signature, not the immaculate breaststrokes. Plus, it implies an easily convertible liquid asset, unlike real estate. I have a confession. I told you that we were here to solve an art mystery, but really, it isn't much of a mystery. The writer for The Federalist is provably wrong. The Trump La Loja is 100% beyond a reasonable doubt fake. The who and the what are much less interesting, you see than the why. And that's why I brought you here, to help me solve the why. In an earlier story about the Vermeer forgeries, we looked at research into how people allowed themselves to be deceived. Here we are going to look from the other side of deception. We're going to study the mind of a liar. 
You may not believe it right now, but when it comes to Trump, the lying might not be so much nature, and it might not be so much nurture, but the physical generation of actual human tissue that helps him to lie. Talk about a tissue of lies! I believe that Donald Trump's body has adapted itself to tell lies. If you're skeptical, then, well, good for you. That is a healthy response to a claim so outlandish. But let me get to the evidence and the scientific studies before you make up your mind. Then we can discuss it in the comments. In reviewing the scientific literature, it seems that telling a falsehood, even on a daily basis, is commonplace. And it is actually an expected developmental milestone in children. To lie is human. The thing is, most people don't lie maliciously or bigly or oftenly. A Duke professor ran an experiment to find out how much normal people are likely to lie. He eventually amassed a large group of test subjects who were asked to solve math problems within a certain amount of time. When they finished, they would be asked how many they had solved and get payment for the number of problems completed. Without looking at it, the scratch paper used by the test subjects to arrive at solutions was put into a paper shredder. It wasn't a shredder. It made shredding noises, but it didn't shred the important bits of paper. The professor was able to see how many problems they actually solved and compare it to the number the students had claimed. Usually the students had finished about four problems, but requested payment for six. Seventy percent of the 40,000 people tested lied. Yet, of the 40,000 people tested, only 20 claimed real whoppers, saying that they had solved all of the math problems. So generally, the students would lie, but only a little. This conclusion was supported by another experiment the professor conducted. This trial involved the use of a vending machine. Quote, the machine was set up to say that bags of candy cost 75 cents on the outside, but its mechanism on the inside was set to zero cents. So when people put money in the vending machine, they would get extra bags of candy and all of their money back. A big sign on the vending machine read, If there's something wrong with this machine, please call this number. Nobody called, but nobody took more than four bags of candy. Other studies have looked at the brain using imaging devices. These help scientists understand the physical nature of lying. In the section above, we saw that only about 0.05% of the population, that's 20 people out of 40,000, are likely to be big liars. How did they achieve that status? Psychologist Tali Sharot of University College London set up another clever trap to induce fraud from unsuspecting test subjects. The difference with this test was that the scientists were able to peer into the brains of the cheaters. 25 of the volunteers also underwent neuroimaging via MRI. The amygdala, a brain structure that responds to and processes unpleasant emotional experiences, erupted with activity after the first self-serving lie. That fits with the idea that lying is aversive. People like to think they're good, and as children, most people absorb the message that lying is immoral. At first, we do it only a little, so our perception of ourselves doesn't suffer, Sherrod said. But amygdala activity decreased before each subsequent lie. The sharper the decrease, the greater a volunteer's lie in the next round. That suggested the decrease in amygdala activity was easing people's slide down a slippery slope. Lying, it seems, becomes easier and less painful with experience. Do you think that Trump would show any amygdala response after one of his latest lies? And that may also have something to do with our next experiment. A 2005 study published in the British Journal of Psychiatry may contain the answers we are seeking. The researchers expected to find that the brains of liars were deficient in some respect. What they found instead was surplus brain matter. They selected groups of people from three categories. Compulsive liars, antisocial types who didn't lie as much, and others with no history of compulsive lying or other antisocial behavior. Then they put all of them, one at a time, through, quote, a magnetic resonance imaging scanner and took pictures of their prefrontal cortex. They chose to focus on this area of the brain because previous studies had shown that the prefrontal cortex plays a role in both lying and in antisocial behaviors. If you could look into this part of the brain, which sits right behind your forehead, you would see two kinds of matter, gray and white. Gray matter is the groups of brain cells that process information. Most neuroscience studies focus on gray matter, but nearly half the brain is composed of connective tissues that carry electrical signals from one group of neurons to another. 
This is the white matter. Roughly, gray matter is where the processing happens and white matter connects different parts of the brain, helping us to bring different ideas together. The Liars and Yang study had on average 22% to 26% more white matter in their prefrontal cortex than both the normal and antisocial controls. The researchers postulate that people with that much white matter are able to make more connections and quicker connections than the rest of us. Connections like, because I am Trump, that was the largest inauguration crowd ever. I believe that Donald Trump has biologically transformed himself into the world's most prolific liar. Sure, he had the very best narcissism and insecurities to begin with, but like an Olympic sprinter doing squats and leg presses, he has mutated his own biology to perform at peak efficiency. His amygdala response has withered away, while the white matter, the connective tissue in his prefrontal cortex, has grown to astounding proportions. The greatest growth occurs before the age of 25, but it has continued with Trump. There is actual science behind the old adage, practice makes perfect. Now this is a theory and I'm not a doctor. Moreover, there is no single explanation for a person who would prefer to lie. This theory, though, explains how Trump began to lie like any normal person, but for him, it snowballed over time until now the very physiology of his body facilitates his falsehoods. It also doesn't hurt that all of his heroes, his father, Hitler, Putin, basically any dictator, resorted to either sales puffery or propaganda, which is state-sponsored lying. There are certainly many factors at play, but Trump's physical morphology, compared to you or me, seems to be implicated. Finally, there have been limited repercussions for his lying. In this story, you have seen absolute proof, exclusive to this video, that the second Trump Renoir is a fake. But that is actually small potatoes compared to the science behind that lie and Trump's many other, more consequential lies. The media waited for years for Donald Trump to make a presidential pivot. It never occurred, and we know, at least in part, why. The war on truth involves more than just the big lies. It also includes the stupid little ones. It's a two-front war. Not only are we inundated with lies, but the means to detect them are being hindered or removed, from homeschooling to the conservative media to the denigration of higher education to bot farms. There exists an assault on our ability to determine the truth. Like many of you, I enjoy science fiction. In the future, we were supposed to get the jetpacks, the meal in a tiny capsule, and the larger brains, until one day, a glorious day, we would evolve into beings of pure energy. Or so the story goes. But what if, instead, our evolution took us down the path of larger brains, purpose-built for lying? Is that where we want to go? In that world, truth would not be beauty, and beauty would not be truth.